Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Today's webinar will be about making comics for both print and webtoon in Cliff Studio Paint, presented by Simon Lindenthaler. Regarding the webinar, there are some housekeeping items that we'll go through. The webinar will be approximately one hour long. All attendees will be muted. Question and answer session will be during the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Attendees can ask questions into the GoToWebinar question box right away. Due to time constraints, not all questions will be answered. The webinar will be recorded. Recording will be shared on social media and will be sent via email to all registrants and attendees. The panelists for this webinar are Fahim Nias, Joanna Brower, Marie Quinones, myself, and Simon Lindenthaler. For those of you who are joining us for the very first time and have never heard about Clip Studio Paint, Clip Studio Paint is your all in one solution for stunning, ready to publish illustrations, comics, manga, and animations. Learn more at clipstudio.net forward slash n and graphicsly.com. And with that, we'd like to pass the reins of the webinar over to Simon, who will begin his presentation, making comics for both print and webtoon in Clip Studio Paint. Thank you so much. All right, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, thank you especially to Graphicsly. Uh, thank you to Celsius. Thank you to uh, Wacom and uh, Clip Studio Paint for allowing this opportunity. Uh, just to start, um, I want to introduce myself real quick. My name is Simon. I live in Austria in the tiny town of Graz, which is a very beautiful town, as you can see here. Once the pandemic is over, you should totally come visit. I've been uh, working here at an ad agency as a graphic designer and recently as an art director. And uh, during my evenings, I very often work on my webcomic, Weird Dogs. And the thing about Weird Dogs is that I make it both for a webtoon uh, and for a regular print uh, comic. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So maybe you're wondering why uh, make a comic both as a webtoon and both as a print version? So the thing is, maybe you know you have a comic already as a print version, and maybe you're looking for more people for a new audience for new people to find your comic. And platforms like uh, Webtoon or Tapas are just really great places these days to find new readers, find a new audience. And uh, maybe the other way around, maybe you are, uh, already have a Webtoon and you're like, okay, my comic is successful enough to maybe want to run a print uh, run on Kickstarter, or maybe you want to just like, you know, also find a publisher and just have your comic published that way. And those are all ways how you could, you know, like have both formats. It makes sense to have both formats. And the thing you'll see here, for example, on this page of Weird Dogs is that it's a different uh, format in, in terms of how you present your story. Because on uh, a regular comic page, you immediately have a bunch of panels visible at once. So, for example, you'll you'll have uh, I'll switch to a page with more panels. For example, here you have uh, five panels visible at once, whereas here on a webtoon version that you're going to be looking at on a phone screen, most likely, you maybe see like one, two, three at most panels at once. And so that creates a different reading experience. And it also requires a bit of a different process in making your pages or making your webtoon. And uh, I personally started out making Weird Dogs only for print until the webtoon contest came along, where I decided to submit my comic. And in working on uh, adapting the comic, uh, I just like ran into some issues where I found out, hey, this. I could do this better. Like it wasn't like an ideal process. I had to change things a lot. And over the process of working on like four chapters of this comic, I've learned just a bunch of tricks 
for how personally for me it's gonna just like really streamline the process a bit and that's what i'm going to be talking about so just briefly again the reason that uh it's easier and why i personally start by making a page and then move on to a webtoon is that uh like i said on a page you have multiple panels visible at once and just uh, having a composition where there's a nice reading flow uh it's a lot easier to start out with a comic page than with a webtoon it's it's a little bit more constricting uh, a page where there's more rules you need to pay attention to compared to webtoon and so that's why i start out with comic page we're going to be talking about this in a bit more detail as we move on so now let's for example think about okay you're starting your new comic project maybe you already have a comic going or maybe you're just working on the next chapter of your comic or maybe it's your first time making a comic maybe you plan on submitting a, a, a short story to webtoons contest that's going to start uh, at the end of the month and so now let's start and just make a new comic page just click a new file uh, in Clip Studio Paint, and then up top here, you have four buttons. And the second button here is for comics, and you'll find a bunch of useful presets here already. Now, since we're making comics for print first, we're gonna think about, okay, what size do I want my comic printed at? Is it maybe A4 or is it A5 or, or just a different format? And maybe your, your size that you want is not in here in these presets. Then you can go in to that third button here and you can select, okay, I want the unit in inches or millimeter, for example. And I can go in, I can fine tune the exact size of the canvas that I want. That's the size of the comic page. I want just the final format, uh, just where I want the content of the comic to be like this. I can just set that here and I can even set the bleed width. The bleed width is something that you're going to use in print and I'll be talking about it in a bit more detail later on. Now we're going to move on. We're just going to use a, a sample page, uh, just one of the default templates here, just resolution 350 dots per inch. That's perfectly fine for most comics. If you're working in monochrome, you'll find that here it's already set to a higher resolution, but we're going to make a colored comic, for example. And so we're just going to start and we are meted here, we're met here with uh, three uh, guidelines. And I'm gonna be drawing up just some rectangles to illustrate what these guidelines are. The inner one here is the main page content. The middle one here, that's our border. And then the outer one, that's the bleed. So if you're making a comic, if you're sketching out a page, what you'll want to do as you're drawing your comic is like you, you have a panel here, you have a panel here, you have another panel here. And what you'll want to do as you're drawing your comic, you, maybe sometimes you want to have an impact and you don't want to have a panel. Like for example, a character is just going to be standing here free form because it's just a big focus on that character. And they're just like supposed to make a big impact. And um, so now what you wanna keep in mind, as your art extends past the red uh, border here, the red square, which is the main page, uh, you're gonna want to extend that onto the border. So this, the border is sometimes like, if you want to have a page count on your comic, that's maybe for example, where it goes. But like in this example, we're just having a character there extended beyond that. And if you extend your art beyond that, if you have your art in this blue section, you'll also want to extend it to the bleed section, which is this dark blue area. And the reason for that is like if a machine prints out your comic at say uh, a size, it always prints it at a big, bit bigger size, and then it cuts it to the final format. And the bleed is there that if the machine just has a little bit of an error, that there's a bit of a margin for the machine to still just cut off the page with still all the color visible and no white edges. 
And something else that you want to keep in mind, let's say we have this character here and we're going to have this character talking. What you want to do is you want to make sure that all your dialogue that you're going to have in your comic is just going to be in the red section in like the main page content. That's perfectly fine to have a character or a background extending beyond that. But if, for example, you have a character say something here, that's just not going to look good. It's going to look cramped for your readers. And so I would never add any dialogue in this middle section here. That's usually just the border. And you only want like unimportant visual information here. All right. So now that I've explained these terms, one more quick thing. If you don't want these guidelines visible at any point, you could just go to View and select the Crop Mark Default Border option, and you'll see it disappear. You can have it uh, selected again, just in case you want to look at your page without the crop marks uh, visible for a second there. All right, so the next step is to draw up a panel. Now, if you draw up a panel in Clip Studio, you have the Create Frame option here. And you can create panels. You can just draw up a panel one by one. You can just adjust it. You can select the object tool. You can change the panel size later. You can change the shape. You can do that however you want. Personally, I like to do it a different way. I like to make one big panel that's constrained to the full page size. And then I'll use the cut frame border tool to go in and divide that up into panels. And the reason why I do it like this is because when you use this divide frame folder tool, you can select the gutter. The gutter is the space between panels. So for example, if I want to have a bit of a wider gutter, I can just put in 200, for example. I can pull up the divide frame folder tool. If I hold down shift, I can make sure it's a perfectly horizontal or vertical line. Or of course, I can just make it you know, uh, diagonal. And that way, I can ensure that all the, the distance between the panels is always uniform. Now, maybe you don't want that for your comic, then you're fine just pulling the panels however you prefer, but that's just how I do it. And honestly, even before I do that, I actually move on when I have this basic panel here, and my next step is to add all the dialogue in my comic. So I'll briefly switch over to Google, to Google Docs. This is where I write my comic script. I have a little way of like formatting things, and this is like just how I format it. I just have like each episode marked with like a colored backdrop. So I know like, okay, one episode contains three pages in this instance, or in this instance, it's just two pages. Maybe for uh, you, you have, uh, you know, a very long, a very dramatic webtoon, and it's maybe like an equivalent of like 10 pages. That's perfectly up to you. Only thing you'll want to keep in mind is when you make an episode and you decide, okay, I want to cut off uh, the episode here and I want to include these many pages, is like to make, have it make sense. Maybe it's a dramatic ending or maybe it's an ending, you know, for a certain scene, you're moving on to a different environment with your characters. That's always ways to cut off uh, an episode on Webtoon. And so now you'll see that every time I have a line break here, that for me personally is how I separate like panels uh, on a page. Maybe later on I'll move it around and as I'm sketching and drawing things, I'll find, hey, I need another panel. But basically this is just how I format my script. So let's start by copying this text and I'm just gonna copy it over. I'm gonna select the text tool here in Clip Studio. Just gonna click in here and just gonna paste the text. Now. You'll see that since I had the frame folder selected, the text was immediately placed in the frame folder. I'm just gonna, for now, move the text out of the frame folder, and why, I'll explain in a second. For now, I'm just gonna copy this text. I'm just gonna go back to Google Docs, and just gonna copy the next line of text, and I'll just add all of the text. And the thing, uh, but the reason why I'm doing it this way, why I'm doing this before I'm sketching things, is because I like to make sure 
that I have all the text in there before I add the art. Because once I add the art, like it might be a bit difficult to add the text later on. If I already know, okay, this is how much text there is, I already know that um, this is how much space I have for the art. Whereas if I just start drawing the art and add the text later, I might find out, oh, there's not enough room for the art. Now, how do I do it? And I have to rearrange things. So personally, I find it easier to just have the text uh, just copied like that. So something you may be noticing as I'm pulling up this text, like let me zoom in, it's I'm using my own font. And I would absolutely recommend that if you want a unique visual look for your comic, especially if you have more a hand-drawn style, then it makes sense to make your own font. Personally, I used uh, the website called Calligrapher, which looks like this. And it's very easy uh, to, to just like make something here. You just like get a little template here. I'm gonna show that in a second. There you go. This is what it looks like. You just fill out this template with you know your handwriting you just like upload that to their website and then you get a, a custom font and the basic version of it is free and only if you want to add like font variants or umlauts or whatever you have to use the pro version but it's absolutely worth your money it's a very powerful and easy to use tool and it honestly does a lot to just give your comic a unique visual identity so something else that I want to talk about as we're making text is like you saw that, for example, this, this instance here, this text, it was a bit of a longer uh, text. So the reason is if you're making uh, your comic dialogue, you don't want to put too much text in one single speech bubble. This is, of course, not as bad as sometimes it is, but uh, if you have a lot of uh, dialogue to get through, it makes sense to sometimes just split it up. And the way to do it is like, think about it, okay, if my character is talking and they're saying this dialogue that I've written, like where would they make a pause as they're speaking? Where would they take a break? And just like that, you can like split it up and like separate uh, a dialogue like that. And I want to just take this moment and just like compare how it, how it looks. Um, if we just disable this one real quick, and if we just look at that real quick in comparison, like we have a connection between like this dialogue here. It just looks like, you know, like less information all at once, which makes it a lot easier for readers to look at your comic and, and just not feel like, okay, there's so much text happening. It's a bit overwhelming for me. How am I going to do that? How am I going to read all that text? So now that we have all the text in there, we can start arranging it and just like starting to sketch out the page. And I'm going to just like uh, make a new sketch layer. I'm just going to like sketch out the page. And I know here is a panel where the character is yawning. And just like I'm, I'm just doing rough, quick thumbnails. and you'll find maybe, okay, the text isn't, isn't quite where it needs to be. That's okay. You can just like, you're still moving things around at this stage. You're, you're only figuring out how do you want this uh, to look. Um, you're, you're still experimenting and you don't need to know everything all at once. You can just figure things out as you're going um, and, and just start sketching out the page roughly and then move on to a more detailed sketch. You know, okay, this, this composition works for me. Um, so now you can decide, okay, this is, this is good. We're gonna move on. And now I can make a more detailed sketch. So for example, here, I'm always making for a sketch a raster layer rather than a vector layer. The reason for that is like, I feel like a raster layer is just a lot quicker to just jump into and edit. So for example, I'm just gonna do a more detailed sketch now. Just have the character looking exhausted and, and tired and just sketching that out. And once I have a sketch that I'm happy with, like if you're drawing a comic and if you're used to already drawing your character a bunch of times, you can get away with just doing a very rough sketch 
and then just still making a detailed uh, ink uh, above it. Because you already know where your character looks like, so you only need the basic information if it's not too complex of a pose. So for inking, I want to make a vector layer. So I'm going to move in here, and I'm going to uh, create a vector layer. And the reason vector layers are awesome is because it makes inking a lot faster. You know, for example, I, I draw up this, this line that's supposed to be the head shape of the character. And maybe I find that I'm not satisfied with it. Like, it's not round enough. It's not the exact shape that I want it to be. And so I can go back in. I can select that line. I can, for example, use the mesh transformation tool and just adjust things. And the reason why with a vector layer that's awesome is that it retains the quality. Let's, for example, just take this uh, raster layer with the sketch on it, and let's decide, okay, I want to draw this character bigger in this panel. So I'm going to draw that up really big, and I'm going to press OK. And what I'll notice is that the art gets a bit blurry here. Whereas if I draw a, a vector layer, I'm just going to draw that again real quick, just like, for example, just have like the round little eye, and if I draw that up bigger, it's going to retain that quality because it's just a different technology compared to the raster layer. And that's really awesome to work with. I'm just going to briefly switch to a finished version of the sketch here. Um, so we're going to go to the sample page. I'm going to have the finished one up here just to show you a more detailed example of me inking the comic since I'll have a more exact sketch. So we're going to have Sammy here. And then another exciting feature about the vector layers is that even without the mesh transformation tool, you can still adjust lines easily afterwards. So maybe you don't have to, you know, like, you know, like undo, undo. I'm sure you've seen the memes if you're, if you're a digital artist. You don't have to undo things over and over. You can go in here to the pinch vector line tool, and you can select your pinch level. If you want to change a lot about your line, like the position, you can just use the highest pinch level and you're, you can change, for example, how, how your line is going or change a little bit of it. Or with a more smaller pinch level, you can go in and adjust like details. I can adjust only smaller sections of the line that I drew. And that's really helpful. And another really helpful thing with vector layers is that if I have, like, for example, this eye, I want to draw it and I just draw it quickly, I have these lines intersecting. So now the exciting thing is, for example, also for the hair, I have like intersecting lines because I'm just drawing things really quickly, which if you're drawing a comic and you want to draw a lot of panels and make fast progress, you want to draw things quickly, you don't, you don't want to be slowed down. So now that I have all these intersecting lines, the exciting thing is that I can go to the eraser and select the vector eraser tool and select the option erase up to intersection. And instead of having to manually go in and erase the whole line, I can just like move over with a brush stroke and it erases where that line intersects. And that honestly is such a huge time saver. It's really, really awesome. And it's a feature that I would absolutely recommend you use if you're working in comics or even just in illustration. Uh, it's useful for character art, for backgrounds, for, for pretty much anything. It's just very useful and exciting to work with. So I'm going to just finish up this character art real quick. It's not going to be the most elegant drawing. It's just going to be an example for us to move on and to continue down the tutorial because what we're going to be looking at next is coloring. You may have noticed that I have a color set set up here and you have this option in Clip Studio to make unique color sets and I think especially for a comic where you have recurring characters it makes a lot of sense to just have like these color sets set up for your characters. You can see I have different ones here. I have Sammy here so I can just pick a color from here. I can add that I'm just going to quickly add a background so it's a bit more noticeable uh, because our fur is white. It's not going to show up well on the white background. And then I can use the fill bucket tool. 
I select the fill bucket that refers to other layers, which means it's going to take the line art into consideration and just going to fill the line art of Sammy here. And what I want to do is I want to have the area scaling option selected. I'll just briefly disable this and fill Sammy's uh, fur with a different color. Uh, and I'm going to disable area scaling and just show you how, how it looks. Maybe a, an even dark color. And you see now that there's like these edges that, that start uh, uh, being visible. And that's what area scaling is for because the art only, ex the, the fill of your color only extends to the line art. It doesn't go beyond. So if I activate the area scaling option, you'll see that it just smooths that out and it, it creates a lot nicer visual for your comic. So that's really exciting. And you can also, if you go into the line art layer and change the opacity, you'll, you'll especially see how, how the area scaling effect works. It just goes below your line art a little bit. Another exciting feature about coloring Eclipse Studio is you can add in, uh, if you have like multiple colors, for example, let's say I'm just gonna color the, the eyes the same color as the shirt for now, but I wanna color them white now. So I can click and hold the mouse button down, hold the tablet pen and just move over. And that's really exciting because this means that uh, even if I have no colors yet, I could just click and hold and everything that I mouse over is gonna be filled. But if it's already an existing color, I can just like move over and fill only the parts I can see. I'm, I'm moving over her shirt, but it only filled the starting color where I first clicked. You can also even change, like for example, if you have a, a color set apart here, completely separated, you can still have, if you use in the fill tool, if you disable apply to connected pixels only, you can still immediately fill all instances of that color on your layer. So those are two awesome ways to speed up your coloring process using Webtoon. All right, let's say we have a finished page now. What we're gonna do next? What we're gonna do next is we're gonna export it. And since we said we're gonna export the page for print, we're gonna first make sure that the colors look good in, in, in CMYK. Maybe you're also uh, showing these pages online. You have a regular webcomic site as well, not just Webtoon or Tapas or maybe you uh, upload your pages to Patreon as early updates. That's how I do it personally. So maybe before we do the CMYK export, you wanna do the RGB version. So unless you have Clip Studio X, you have these uh, crop marks, uh, you're not gonna be able to automatically export them. Personally, I only use the pro version of Clip Studio since I don't need the animation features. So I still manually crop the page. And so I crop it down to the final size before I export the RGB version. I just go into File, uh, Export, Single Layer, select JPEG, export the sample page, and I add like a signifier RGB. So I know it's the RGB version of the site, uh, of the page. I just make sure the quality is 100, RGB color, I don't need a huge output size. I can select a pixel width of maybe 1,000 pixels. That's plenty. Maybe even uh, 800 pixels is perfectly fine for just exporting it for uh, uh, your normal webcomic site. Just press OK. I get a little preview. There I go. And that's the RGB version of the uh, page exported. So now that we've done this, we really want to move on to the RGB version for print. And just to illustrate what I'm going to be talking about here, if you're unfamiliar with CMYK and RGB, the differences, there's plenty of tutorials you, you can look at and uh, what exactly the differences are. But just briefly, there are two different color mixing methods. And the thing you're going to have to know for CMYK is that it's going to have a bit of a limited color spectrum compared to RGB. So now I've added this really extreme vivid green, which is especially a case that CMYK is not able to handle very well. So now to make sure your page is gonna look good in CMYK, I'm gonna go to the view menu. 
I'm going to go to the color profile and select preview settings. I'm going to go in here and I have like a bunch of color profiles. And if you have a printer already picked out, you can just ask them or look on their website, which uh, profile are they working with? And just select that one. And you'll notice immediately that the screen just now is not as vibrant anymore. But you can go in here and select a different rendering intent. So for example, with saturation, it's not as bright, but it looks more saturated at least. You can just mix and match and like try and see which option works best, which one comes closest to what you have in mind. You can even set the tonal correction option. You can just go in, change the cyan, change the yellow, change the magenta, just change that however you want it. And once you're done, just click Save on Canvas, select OK. And then you want to just save your file as a separate Clip Studio file. Because, for example, if you still want to go back in and edit your page, maybe you noticed a tiny error that's in the text or in the artwork, you now you don't have to do the color adjustment process again if you already have it saved separately as a CMYK version. And once that's done, uh, you can now go in and export again. So for CMYK, since it's for print, we won't need uh, to crop it first because we want to include the crop marks because that's going to be needed for print. We're going to select here the CMYK color. And of course, we're going to export it at the highest resolution. So we're going to export it at 100% of the image size. We're just going to press OK, get the preview window again, and uh, it's going to take a bit longer, of course, since it's a higher resolution. Perfect. We can see that the crop marks are in there. And that's this uh, CMYK version of our file exported. And uh, once you have all those JPEGs exported, you can uh, use Adobe Acrobat to combine them into a PDF. Or maybe you have a different version of working on a print file. I would suggest looking up different tutorials for that. Uh, I don't have the time to cover all that here, but there's plenty of resources out there. Um, before I move on really quickly, I want to explain the sub view menu. I forgot about that. It's really useful to have that on while you're drawing. For example, if you only have one screen, uh, if you don't have like a, you know, a, a tablet screen like a Cintiq or whatever, you only have one screen available. It's really useful to, to have just like the sub view menu loaded up with some images. You can select multiple ones at once and you can use like reference photos. You can use your own references like floor plans for backgrounds or character sheets or what I often like to do, just use existing comic pages. And from those, I will pick unique colors for a scene. Like for example, a background color, it doesn't make sense for me to make a color set for the backgrounds if those change a lot. But with the sub view menu, you can also down here select the switch to eyedrop or automatically option. And with this option, you just mouse over and you immediately see, oh, I'm picking up this color. I can just add that color. I can go back in, add the second color, just have all these colors that I want immediately in there. So that's really exciting and very useful. And you can zoom in, you can move around, mirror your image, rotate it, you know, just do the same things as on a normal comic page, just all in another little uh, menu alongside your page. That's really useful. So now that we have this done, we have exported our page, uh, we want to move on to actually make uh, the Clip Studio, uh, <laughs> we want to make the Webtoon version. So I'm just going to load up the RGB file because I don't want to be copying the CMYK version of the comic. And I have the finished artwork here. So next, I'm going to go to the new file and I'm going to set up a new image size. And what you need to know, what you need to keep in mind is that for Clips, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm mixing, word, mixing up my words, sorry about that. You should drink some water. What you want to know for Webtoon is that the size for an image to upload is 800 by 1280 pixels. That's the maximum size that one image file for Webtoon can have. Obviously, you can have multiple ones, and that those will be stitched together. 
So what I like to do is I make a new file in Clip Studio that's 50,000 pixels high. And that's probably higher than I'm going to need it to be, but I'm just going to add in all the arts and then crop it down to whatever height I need it to be. I find it easier than having to go in in the middle and then adjusting and making the page longer afterwards. I find it easier just add in all the artwork and then crop it down to the height that I need it to be. And for the width, I don't pick 800 pixels. I pick the, uh, the triple value of that because in case I draw any art specific to just the Webtoon version, like sometimes I'll add in a panel just for the Webtoon version to create a better reading flow. Uh, in case I do that, I already have my arts available in a higher resolution, which is going to be useful if I want to, you know, use my art for, for the print version after all, or just create bonuses for readers. So what I'm going to do next, since I have the finished page here, I'm going to start copying over panels. And what you want to do is you want to make sure you don't have the object tool selected. If I copy this frame and I just paste it, you'll see I only copied the frame itself, not the content. That's going to happen if you use the object tool. So for example, just select the move layer tool, and then you can just copy your panel over. And you can copy all of the panels at once. You can only copy like uh, one at a time, however you want to do it. That's, that's perfectly fine. That's just whatever your own preference is. I switch it up. Sometimes I, I copy it one at a time. Sometimes I copy all of them. It really doesn't matter. And just do it however you want it. And if you're new to the process of making Webtoons, it makes sense that if you have your page sketched out, you want to, before you move on to inking your page and coloring your page, you want to first sketch out what the webtoon is going to look like. So for example, this is one of the pages uh, where I made a sketch first. So this is just what the webtoon version of the sketch looked like. And uh, because I made a sketch here, I knew something very important. And this is honestly the main thing you're going to have to keep in mind as you're working on webtoons, is that sometimes you want to have a very drastic difference between how your panels are arranged. And to make your job of rearranging things easier, what you want to do is you want to separate the line art layers, you want to separate the color layers, especially for different characters in instances like this. You don't need to do it always, but it definitely helps in moving things around, resizing things. If you know, okay, you have things on a different layer, it's easier to do that beforehand than afterwards. Just like this page, let's quickly go to this page and see what it looks like on uh, Clip Studio. So since I knew I was gonna move things around, since I knew, uh, okay, here in the phone screen, that's roughly this red rectangle, I knew I wanted readers to first see the speech bubble and think, okay, hey, what's happening? And then scroll down and, and realize, okay, Dodger is in a game, uh, is in a paintball match. It, uh, it's a different reading experience. And this is uh, also something, you know, like on a comic page, you have a reading flow of, of moving over the speech bubbles from one panel to another. And on like Webtoon, you have less of that, but you still move through the page in a different way. And so you're gonna have to pay attention to what kind of experience you want to create for readers. So the way I arrange things here is that I have everything set up separately. I have the line art uh, for, for the speech bubbles on a separate layer. I have it labeled. I have the fill color labeled. I have the text labeled. And you'll find that I also uh, finished up, like I, I added in color behind the artwork. And then in this instance, I also finished up artwork behind Dodger because I knew I would move him around and show different parts of Sammy. And it's a lot easier if you do this while you're drawing the comic rather than while you have to go back in and rearrange things and then you have to draw things again. It's easier to just stay in one process, the process of drawing uh, at, at one time 
rather than just switching things up and constantly switching between different processes. So it's a lot easier to just concentrate on different tasks. And I would absolutely recommend name your layers, separate your layers where it makes sense. You don't always have to draw art beneath your, your uh, characters. So for example, here, I separated these three layers because I showed them in a different arrangement in the Webtoon version. And, but this big panel here, it stayed the same in the Webtoon version. I'm just gonna briefly switch to that to show you. So I'm, I'm, I'm starting out here, just compared to the page, this, this is just split up. There's more difference between the panels, but this page is unchanged. And so in this instance, I didn't draw anything behind Sammy or behind all the stuff uh, in the foreground. I didn't finish in details behind Sammy because I knew I wouldn't have to move things around. And so this is why it's a good idea to sketch things out uh, as you go. And um, let's say you're finished with your page. Let's say you have the webtoon finished. Uh, what you want to do is now you want to export it and upload it. And that's honestly pretty much the same process. We're just going to go into the file, export single layer uh, menu, select JPEG, export it. And we want to have the RGB color selected. And for the output size, we want to select 800 pixels. We're going to press OK. And, you know, once you have this big file, you know, OK, but the limit is 1280 pixels in height. So how are you going to get there? You're going to use a tool called Croppy. It's very easy to use. You just go here. You're going to upload your file. And you're going to get a zip file download. And that's going to contain just all your uh, pages split up into different files. And you're able to go into Webtoon. You're going to go add an episode, select all these multiple files all at once. It's going to upload them. You're going to be able to preview how it looks like, which, by the way, if you have your finished artwork before you upload it to Webtoon, I would absolutely recommend upload your image si uh, file to a site like Imager. You don't have to make it public. You can just upload it for yourself, email the link to yourself so you can open it on your phone and read through it on your phone and see what it actually looks like. Because even though you can try to simulate the experience of reading the phone, uh, reading your comic on your phone on the computer, it's still different if you actually read it on your comic uh, on your phone <laughs> and you realize, okay, maybe I want to change things. I want to have the text bigger. The text is too small here. It's just not legible. You always want to make sure that your text is easily legible for people, even if they're reading it on a small phone from, from the early 2010s or whatever, rather than a big iPad or something. You want to make sure the text is at a legible size. So that's basically it. Um, yeah, and I think we can move on to questions. Okay, thank you very much. That was a lot faster than expected. You covered so much in so little time. Um, let's see. For one, um, how did you get started in in doing web comics? Oh gosh, um, I started uh, early on. Like I discovered back in the days, uh, Drunk Duck. If you've ever heard of that, mm -hmm. uh, and you could upload your own comics there and. I, I just started there because I always had an interest in reading comics and making comics. I drew my own little magazines as a kid on like paper and just stapled them together. I was just always excited about it. And when I discovered that there was an easy way to do that online and share it with people, I just jumped on that. Hmm. Um, and how, was it difficult for you to um, understand the the difference between a page comic a page comic and the webtoon format because that's a it, uh, rather new format yeah it's 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 a pretty new format uh and it, it it definitely took me a while to get used to working with it and like i said uh the first time i did it i realized you know like it's oh it just has a lot of different requirements 
like you know like i said you have only one to two panels visible at once so it's a really different experience but if you're only just getting used to it my best experience uh, my best advice is to just gather some experience by reading other comics other existing webtoons and just figure out okay what are they doing that i like what are they doing that that that's working out what what do i not like and just look uh what's working for them and you can try to you know just experiment and figure that out for yourself mm. do you have any any tips on how how panel spacing works well for you in webtoons as compared to um paged comics um for for panel spacing what do you want to keep in mind um is that uh for example here you can think about uh uh, panel spacing especially, I like to do it, I, I think I mentioned it briefly before on this example. Um, just think about how much uh, of your panel is going to be visible at once on your reader's phone screen. So like I said here, like one, uh, uh, this dialogue was only visible and then you move down and you create kind of a drama and like, okay, what's the dialogue referring to? And then you only see the splash page. That's something that's possible in Webtoon that you can't really do as well on print comics where you just like immediately see, okay, it's a paintball scene. You can create a bit more of a surprise. And for example, you can also like here, you can show a bit more of time passing. Here, all the panels on a page are just like one after the other. It's clear that time is passing based on like the timing, uh, just the compositions, like the light situation, et cetera. But on Webtoon, you can just separate these panels and have your reader scroll for a longer time uh, to create that sense of time passing. So that, for example, is just a way to, to do things. Also, mm -hmm. what you wanna do is you wanna switch up things. Like this here is one conversation. So here there's only small uh, dis distances between the panels, but I'm switching things up. Like this is a full panel. This one is a bit smaller. It's all positioned on the right. This one's positioned on the left. Just switching things up a bit to keep things less rigid and make it more interesting to read. Um, I see on this this one, you have the, the black background and the white background. I think in a lot of, um, Pan in a lot of webtoons, like the black background or like a gradient is, is an indicator for past. Do you have any rules in your own comics like that? Um, I personally, I wouldn't say I have any specific rules. Uh, I just like to like, if it's, if it's a night scene, I think it makes sense to have like a, a dark background. Whereas if it's a daytime scene, it makes sense to have it on a white background. And sometimes if I transition into a new scene, I, I can have, you know, like, a, I sometimes have a hard cut or sometimes I have a bit of a gradient. Um, I think especially for instances where uh, I have my character have a vision, I have, I like to have like uh, an instance here, it's, it's, it's a straight cut, but then on another page, um, let me just load that up here um oh wait that's a different episode sorry <laughs> <laughs> so for example here i have a transition where it's not a gradient but it's like uh there's no panel border and i'm just like i have like these basically it looks like paint splats and those extend to like the panel above a little bit and that's also a transition that you can have hmm. <laughs> very cool <laughs> um so when you create comics for print, you have to usually put them on a pretty large format with high resolution. And one question was, how do you balance um, detail when you have a high format, a high resolution file compared to a webtoon that's usually only visible on smaller phones? You, okay, um, this is a very good question. Um, one thing that I, that I've learned in making comics is like digitally, you know, if you pull up a big image size, you're you're tempted to just zoom in. You're tempted to zoom in and be like, okay, I have a tiny brush size, and so I can add in all this detail. But the thing is, like, if you think about it, like, okay, I have this tiny detail here, this tiny character, um, and the thing is, if you zoom out, 
And if you're going to read that at maybe this size, that detail is not going to be legible. So what I uh, like to do and what I like to keep in mind is like I always work with the same brush size, except if I'm like maybe doing special things like lettering, I have a bit of a smaller brush size. But if I'm just doing my normal inks, even if I'm working on a background detail, I don't switch to a smaller brush size because it keeps things legible at the same level as, as like a main artwork. And that I feel like helps uh, create a sense of like uh, a unified look and it helps you manage, uh, you know, create uh, the art at a good size where it's, where it's still legible. And if you're going to move over to the webtoon, uh, obviously there you have different options and you can you can make a panel that's big on a comic page you can make it bigger uh on a webtoon for example so for example if i take this panel here of uh sammy and i'm just going to open up the clip studio file uh, as an example real quick what you can do is uh if you pull up uh, an art bigger uh, than it is normally, you can still go back in there. And uh, if you want to have the line art matching the rest of the line art, then the, the cool thing is like, if you're working with vector layers and let's say, okay, you're pulling up this small panel a lot bigger, like maybe you want to, it to have more impact than it did on the page. And, Maybe now you'll find that, hey, the line art now looks thicker than it did, uh, than all the other panels do. So what you can do with the vector layer also is, is another great feature, is you can go in and you have the vector layer here and, and you'll notice the line art is much thicker. So it, it doesn't look quite like the two panels fit together very well. But you have here the tool, correct line width, you can go in and you can, for example, select the narrow option here because we're going to make it thinner. We're going to make a big brush size to cover all of Sammy here. We're just going to go over that a few times. And you we're, we're now at a place where the line art looks to be the same thickness as for the panel with Dodger. So that's a nice way to handle, uh, you know, like different uh, panel sizes between like a print version and between, between a webtoon and still keep things interesting. I, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That, that was really, really good. New feature too. Um, you talked about text a little bit at the beginning. Uh, how do you choose your font size? Honestly, uh, for choosing your font size, uh, I think the best option is uh, if you have a printer at home, just make a test page and try out a few font sizes. Let's, let's for example, okay, take you, you have this one dialogue and okay, this, you're just gonna try it out. You're gonna make it a little bit bigger the next time, maybe a bit smaller the other time. Just print it out. Since we're thinking about, we're, we're, we wanna make the comic available in print. We're just gonna try out these different sizes. We're gonna print it out and then we just, uh, figure out, okay, this is still legible enough. This might be too big. This might take up too much space from my artwork. Just find a happy medium. If you don't have a printer, you can also just like look at other comics online, whether that's published comics, they often have preview images. Just load up a preview image of your comic uh, that, you, that you want to have as like a guideline and just base your text size on that. And for doing the Webtoon version, also the text size, you wanna make sure that um, you have a uniform size just on a page uh, as well. Like if I have a character yelling, that's gonna be bigger. If, if a character is like making a loud sound, you're gonna have that bigger. And if a character is whispering, that's gonna be smaller. But other than that, you wanna make sure that all the text on your comic page is generally the same size. And yeah, just refer to other comics, uh, how they do it. And, or if you have a printer, print it out for yourself. Okay. Um, let me check for questions. There were some that wanted to, wanted you to go a bit more 
into detail, show some things again. Um, on the vector layer, could you show again how you do the um, erase to intersection trick? That okay. You <laughs> um, so if I have a vector layer here, you have here the options, you know, you make a new raster layer or the vector layer. The vector layer has the little uh, square in, in the icon. And I just draw with, with a regular brush. It can be pretty much any brush. I'm just drawing an art. And like, let's say I'm making a cross hatching, for example. And I have these lines that are all intersecting. And I go into the vector eraser, and, uh, or just the eraser tool at all, and then I select vector eraser. And here I have a few different options. I can erase touched areas, I can erase up to intersection or the whole line. Let's just briefly look at whole line. I move over and I let go of the mouse cursor and it erase the whole line. And if I'm using erase up to intersection, it only erases uh, where it touches the other lines. So you see, it'll, it'll touch those other lines and I can just erase all, the part of it that touches all the other lines, but the rest of the line here stays uh, visible. And that's really useful, especially for, for like, for example, like I often use it if I draw like a background, like I have like, for example, a, a table here or a counter for, for like a kitchen. I briefly switch to the eraser. Uh, I'm currently just uh, switching the tool by turning around my tablet pen. And I'm just drawing these lines very fast, very quickly, because I know I can just erase things. And then I can even go back in and fix things with the pinch line tool and just work very quickly and very fast that way. And I hope that was clear uh, to follow. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, you have a lot of different um, speech bubbles in your in your comic that are mm -hmm. very out of the ordinary? Do you draw them mostly yourself or do you use any presets? Yeah, I use, uh, I draw all the speech bubbles by myself. Uh, I know that Clip Studio has like specific uh, bubble tools. Personally, I like having like not perfectly round uh, bubbles. So I just like draw a, a, a bubble very quickly on a vector layer. Then I usually just fix up the, the endpoints and it's not a perfect uh, circle, which for me personally, I like how that creates more of an organic look. And same for the, uh, the tail. I can just, again, use the vector line, uh, the eraser functions to just quickly create uh, the, the shape that I want. And uh, yeah, I, I draw all of the speech bubbles by hand. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's easier than just like having different sizes that I just copy and paste. I think it's personally faster, but you could of course just save a specific speech bubble and save it to your materials um, here in, in Clip Studio. That's that's definitely an option, but personally I don't use that. Okay. Um, so how when you compare creating a page and creating an episode, I know an episode is a lot longer than a single page do you have a time frame uh -huh. that you you that you use to create either one but by time frame i mean just how long it takes me yeah yeah just just roughly um yeah i've uh i've started tracking how, how long it takes me I, I would have to look it up like i have like and i would recommend doing this honestly uh just even just for a few pages uh, to just track uh, how long it takes you to make a comic page. So what I do, I'll pull up my my uh, spreadsheet file here. Hang on. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, I, I track it a little bit, and you see, for example, here the page inks. I started at this time, I ended at this time, and then I just roughly write down. Okay, that took me two hours. That took me, you know, uh, maybe just half an hour. You'll see I always ink things first, and then I move on to the colors, and then I reformat things. And you'll see the reformatting process usually, if, if it's not like a complex page or an episode, it usually doesn't take me too long. Um, but yeah, for, for one page, and this is obviously not including like the sketching itself, 
but I would say maybe from sketching, inking, and coloring per page, maybe it takes me like four or five hours uh, mm. per page. Oh, wow. Um, and then for an episode, it's just a reformatting process and doing something new that's the the one hour? Yeah, uh, it's mostly the reformatting process. Sometimes I'll add in uh, new panels uh, for, for the Webtoon version. Mm -hmm. For example, here, uh, this is two pages and you'll see uh, this, this bottom panel here. I split up the position of the speech bubbles up here. You, you'll see that. Mm -hmm. And then on the next page, we, we just move on to a different panel. And in the Webtoon version, I, I was just like, okay, this now now that we have this bubble up here and this bubble down here, we, we just have like the next dialogue. I, I thought, okay, maybe it makes more sense to split up the first section of this dialogue, which is here, and give that its own unique panel, just so there's less text all at one after another. And just having a nice little gag on the page, it would have felt like it's cramping uh, the, the composition, like it's too much going on for, for just a single page. But in the Webtoon version, since it's obviously, it can be as long as you want it to be, and you have an ability to just fit in however many panels you want, um, I was able to just add a, an extra panel there. So obviously, if I do that, it's going to take me a bit longer uh, for an episode. And sometimes like the reformatting process, I move things around more than maybe it's going to take longer than an hour. Maybe it takes two hours. It, one Between one and two hours, I think, is, is roughly the amount that on average. Mm -hmm. Wow. Very, very cool. Like there is so much in this in this webinar already and i think we need to come to an end so um okay. just, just one last one last question do you have any general tips for people who just want to start out with either comics for print or comics for webtoon just some general tips my my general tip is to start small like i know we all probably if we're interested in making comics we all have this big idea of like this big a graphic novel that's going to be a long and epic story with all these amazing characters and fantastic settings and i think the 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 best advice i have is just start small for weird dogs i was just like the the first chapter even i was just like okay i just want to see if i can do one chapter i want to try out one chapter um i mentioned i started making comics a long time ago when like you had websites like Drunk Duck and Weird Dogs I had on there in a different version. And I, you know, like I, I was still figuring out arts and figuring out making comics. It was just a kind of a mess, just, you know, learning new things and trying new things. It, it didn't have a unified look or anything. Uh, and I ended up just quitting halfway through a story because I was just not satisfied anymore. And I think it's it's perfectly fine to just start out and if, if you're unhappy with something, just scrap it and start over. It's it's part of the learning process and just be patient with yourself. Um, and yeah, sometimes it also can help to just participate in events like the, the Webtoon short story contest. Like maybe, you know, like if it's your first creation, like still just participate for fun and to learn, not to win just you know okay you have these requirements you know it's going to have to be either for example a, a story that's heartfelt or mind bending it just already gives you a few ideas and it's going to be like you only need 30 panels you have the set amount or even events like the 24 hour comic day just little events like that can help you maybe just give you a, an opportunity just to make your first comic make it a short one just figure out learn and then move on to bigger ideas little by little even just you know like make an, a comic that's a bit easier to draw that's perfectly fine you'll you'll learn along the way and that's one of the exciting things about comics like whenever someone asked me for for uh, art advice i just tell them you know like make a comic because you're going to learn so much in comics you're going to learn about like drawing characters you're going to draw backgrounds you're going to figure out typography and composition you're going to figure out color if you're doing a color comic there's just so much you're going to learn and if you have a story that for example you, you only are used to drawing people 
and you hate drawing cars, but your story needs these characters to drive a car, you're going to have to figure out how to draw a car. It's just going to throw you out of your comfort zone. And that's the best way to learn. And so I think comics are just a really great way to improve your art overall. Okay, thank you so much. That was, that was, I think, the perfect ending to this. Um, that was, that was a great webinar. I think the audience agrees. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you as well. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, I know we could be like hours. We, we have learned a lot and we really appreciate um, this presentation, Simon. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And thank you also, Joanna, for all the questions. There were plenty of questions that couldn't be answered, but I'm pretty sure that we, we, we got the best from Simon. And uh, just to finish the webinar, I would just like to tell you that for more information, learn more about Clip Studio Paint, please visit eclipsestudio.net forward slash and graphicsly.com. As I mentioned you, the webinar will be recorded and also posted online on our YouTube channels, Celsius Web and also Graphicsly. And for more information about Simon, please visit his Instagram, his Twitter, and also his website to be updated on his latest comic books and also his webtoons um, and other projects, of course. So again, we really appreciate the presentation. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, too. Thank you. And I hope to see you on our next webinar. So thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.